few weeks ago, a friend who's much younger than me, more than 20 years, came to me and was concerned about a certain state of affairs. He was noticing that he was becoming more cynical. But on top of that, he was worried that this cynicism might somehow transform into a profound misanthropy. And I assured him that that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. But the question as to why people become cynics and why cynicism is a thing is an important one. It's an important one that requires an answer because most people hate cynicism. They don't like it and there are reasons for this. And strangely enough, or not so strangely enough, this attitude towards the cynical and towards cynics is most common among the ultra successful. And it should come as no surprise as to why that's the case. Now I submit to you, there are two primary trajectories that one follows in order to become cynical. The first one is the simpler one. It is related to the Matthew effect, to the luck that life bestows upon you or does not bestow upon you. And so quite simply put, if you've had a lot of fortune in your life, you were born with good genetic conditions. So you're tall, attractive, intelligent, industrious, your parents are wealthy, you live in a nice neighborhood. All these factors, these factors outside of your control, lead oftentimes to a positive Matthew effect loop. If most of your life has been checkered by success, then you're probably disinclined to be overly cynical because you would view life after a certain amount of time has passed as a winning proposition. You start off very young, things happen that are positive, maybe you're popular, maybe you're attractive, maybe you're smart, maybe it's a combination of these things, and eventually one success builds upon the next success. And so it goes and so it goes, and this results in a chain reaction. That is the positive Matthew effect loop. It's not to say that you never suffer failures in such a scenario, it's just that the overwhelming majority of the chains in the chain reaction are positive. And therefore, you can extract from these experiences a quote-unquote positive experience, which then translates to a lack of cynicism. If most things in life have worked out for you, then there probably isn't much of a reason to be cynical, although there are other reasons to be cynical that I'll get to in a bit. But generally speaking, that's the pattern. The contrary of the successful chain reaction that leads to the positive Matthew effect loop is, of course, the negative Matthew effect loop. A lack of success produces yet another lack of success. And so if this negative causal chain results in an overall negative outcome for yourself, then over time that's going to amount to a much more cynical view of life. And these two parallels the positive Matthew effect loop and the negative Matthew effect loop are typically what's causal with respect to cynicism or lack thereof. A very famous example of this might be Chad Williamson, who's been very outspoken towards so-called cynics. He went so far as to say at some point in time that even if the cynics were right, he doesn't care and doesn't want to know. And Chad Williamson is a man who has overwhelmingly had a lot of success in his life. He's a professional model. Before that, he owned and ran nightclubs, and now he's a gigantic podcaster with a million and a half subscribers. It's probably literally impossible for him to become cynical given the trajectory of his life, and he finds it unfathomable and incomprehensible that anyone would be cynical to begin with, which is understandable because people in that position rarely have the capacity to empathize with people that have not had the positive Matthew effect loop. They think that their existence is the norm. And to be fair, people in negative Matthew effect loop, their existence is their norm. And so this is a case of sort of never the twain shall meet. There is no common ground that can be agreed upon in this scenario. So this is the most common filter for cynicism or lack thereof, I would argue. It's the most readily accessible. Now, there are other reasons to be cynical, and these other reasons can coexist either with a positive Matthew effect loop or a negative one. I've seen both, and there's abundant evidence that this particular perspective, which I'm about to get into, can coexist with both life trajectories, both the positive and negative Matthew effect loop. And this is related to understanding the universe, or more specifically, understanding people and humanity. If you understand human beings, then you understand that we are animals, nothing more, nothing less. If you really look into it, you discover all kinds of horrific things that we do all the time. Some of these things have been obscured by the veil of modernity and modern civilization more broadly. 
for example, in all the debates about abortion, people are very quick to forget that for most of human history, infanticide was a regular practice. What did people used to do until comparatively recently when they realized there were only so many children they could take care of? Well, they would very frequently just abandon their children and leave them to perish. Sometimes they would actively, violently make them perish. And this type of practice, which is what we call infanticide, was a very, very common thing throughout all of human history up until very, very recently. The mating and dating game, one of the most transactional, if not the most transactional form of human relationship to exist. Knowing all the details of it, the fact that it is essentially a job interview and you and your life are the CV, just to say all the things you've achieved in some part, in addition to the obvious factor of the basic looks test, i.e. the halo effect or lack thereof, and the fact that even during a relationship, especially during a relationship, the job never stops. You must constantly prove yourself worthy of the other person, especially as a man. It's all transactional. What we call love is a mere ticking of the boxes on the job application form. And should you fail to tick some of these boxes, love too will disappear rather quickly. You might recall that I've talked about a number of times this huge shift of reproductive success during the agricultural era, where seemingly for every 17 females, only one man succeeded in reproducing. What happened there? The most modern research tells us that basically, after agriculture had spread throughout Eurasia, as well as Africa, there weren't enough plots of land to grow your crops. And so what became a practice for almost 2,000 years was extremely violent behavior, whereby farmers and agriculturalists would wage war and attack other such farmers and agriculturalists. They would slay them, all the males, regardless of their age, babies, young boys, adult men, and would take the women either as wives and would violate them. And this went on for almost two millennia. This is how human beings are. We are brutal, boorish animals. And the reality is that you simply need the right environmental trigger to create this type of behavior. You can turn humans very easily into brutish, nasty beasts with the right environmental trigger, which is why all this is just a giant facade. And if you think about it, all the mental gymnastics that we engage in in order to ward off the reality that we inhabit, the truth of how egregious the situation actually is. Well, this too can lead to cynicism. If you understand the human condition properly, as it is, not idealistically, whether you've had a positive or a negative Matthew effect loop, you can end up very cynical. A great example of this is the world-famous neurobiologist Robert Sapolsky, who recently published his magnum opus, Determined, a book about our lack of free will. This guy is incredibly successful. He's married, he has children, he's world famous, he's incredibly smart, and yet he's deeply cynical. Why is that? Because he spent an entire lifetime studying both human and primate nature, baboons and human beings. And it's like that saying from Nietzsche, when you look into the abyss, the abyss stares back at you. He's a very cynical person despite all of his life success. On the other hand, you have somebody like Chad Williamson, who over time has learned a great deal about human nature and seemingly has not become cynical. Because usually the only way you can prevent that type of cynicism from entering into the equation is by pretending. Pretending that the sky is not blue, pretending that it's not raining, pretending that love is some kind of mystical, ethereal process pretending that human beings have risen above the state of being animals. That's what you do in order to maintain optimism and to prevent yourself from becoming a cynic. The more fairy tales we can conjure up, the greater our protection against reality. But some of us cannot do that. I've had throughout most of my life largely a negative Matthew effect loop. And on top of that, I have a fairly good understanding of human nature. And all that combined has made me a cynic, which is why I'm such a pariah and so alien to so many people. On the one hand, I'm a life failure, and many people would then say, oh, that's just sour grapes. On the other hand, I have a pretty good understanding of human nature, the underlying nature, as we actually are. We are animals, nothing more, nothing less, and we behave accordingly. In which case, where's the sour grapes there? I'm reasonably convinced, all things considered, that if I had had a positive Matthew effect loop and had been even moderately successful in life, or even very successful, my drive to understand the human condition would have led me down the route of cynicism regardless. Now back to my friend's question, now he's an interesting case. He's a very successful person, he's very young, he's very intelligent, he's already married and planning to have children, 
and he's one of the best in his field in the world. Why is he becoming cynical? Well, again, because he's beginning to understand human nature. But his fear is that he might become a misanthrope. Now, misanthropy is a very broad term, and nominally it means hatred of human beings. Now, I would submit to you that there is a variant of misanthropy that simply equates to understanding human beings as they are. I don't think we're special, quite the opposite. But that doesn't make me, for example, hate individual human beings. I dislike the human condition. I dislike human nature. And therefore, more broadly, there's something about humanity that I don't really like. Because it seems the only way we can have a positive view of ourselves as human beings is by lying to ourselves about our true nature. But at least in my case, and this is what I told my friend, it's precisely because I do view us, human beings, as such wretched creatures that I'm incentivized towards acts of kindness and understanding towards my fellow human apes. And so cynicism doesn't necessarily have to lead to misanthropy in its purest form. And in some sense, it can uplift you and make you want to help people even more. As always, thank you very much for tuning in. Many, many special thanks to my patrons. You guys are the best. You keep the channel alive. Same thanks goes to my donors on PayPal. You guys are absolutely essential for maintaining the health and existence of the channel. And as for everyone else, if you can engage in the usual YouTube jazz, which apparently is supposed to help, although I've never noticed it to a great degree, of liking the video, subscribing, leaving comments, sharing the video, be much appreciated. If I'm still alive, I'll check you out next time. Until then, may the gods watch over you. Bye-bye for now. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.